Okay, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to uh, be with you this uh, lovely evening. And uh, embarrassingly, I have to apologize for my uh, late coming. I'm so sorry. And after two hours drive, I have to drive you to the uh, <coughs> field or heavens of Shi'i reformism. I hope our next trip will be as successful as it was before I arrived. And uh, thank you very much again. Um, this is uh, really, I am proud and I'm honored that uh, I am here in Berkeley for the first time. This is my first talk, first lecture in Berkeley University and first ever lecture about Shiism and reform in Shiism. I have uh, written a lot about Islam, about reform in Islam, but not specifically about uh, Shiism. You are, of course, aware that I am born a Shi'i and I come from Iran. I was raised as a Shi'i. I am a practicing Muslim within the Shi'i tradition, within the Shi'i framework. And my reform talk here will not be from uh, an extra-religious or extra-Islamic perspective, rather from within the perspective of Islam and rather from within Shi'ism. <coughs> so, uh, you can, of course, look at uh, any creed, any religion, any sect from within or from without. And uh, I have chosen this evening to talk about Shiism and reforming Shiism from within the, uh, 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 the tradition itself. And I think uh, it will be more uh, useful to do that because uh, the uh, religious intellectualism actually has got the task to, uh, to criticize and to revisit the whole Islamic creed. But uh, we had only a Shi'i reform talk from outside Shi'ism. Usually Shi'is, because they have been a minority and they are still a minority, they do not dare criticize themselves and uh, talk about reform. So this is something which uh, I would like to usher in, as uh, Professor Sadri mentioned, and perhaps we will uh, find some uh, um, common points uh, on what I am going to uh, present here to you. Let me start with uh, my personal experience about Shiism and Sunnism and then go on to do some more about uh, Shi uh, uh, tradition. <clears throat> my first earnest exposure and encounter with the Shi'i Sunni divide was when I was uh, still uh, a young student in Tehran University. By some accident, I came across a very important, very important book written by two prominent uh, scholars. One of them is Sunni and the other one is Shi'i. This is an absolutely unique, unique book in the whole Islamic culture all along during 1400 years. The book is a hefty one, comes in eight volumes, and I had the fortune and the luxury to read the whole book from cover to cover. And uh, then I had, again, the opportunity to, to write, you know, a number of articles about the book, and I will come to that. The book uh, is the two authors of the book, rather, the first one lived uh, about 900 years ago, and uh, he's a figure no less than Imam al-Ghazali. I think and I take it that all of you are familiar with one of the most, most prominent scholars uh, of Islam who lived in fifth century, who was an Iranian, who was born in what we call it Khurasan nowadays, and he is buried there, and his tomb is there and is being visited by, by uh, his fans. Now, the second author of the book came 600 years later, and this time not in Khorasan, but in Kashan, to the center of Iran, a city which is very close to Qom and relatively close to Tehran. Um, 
the name of the second author, of course, is Muhammad, and his title is Faith. He is the son-in-law of Sadruddin Shirazi, which I think, again, the Muslim scholars, the scholars of Islamic studies are absolutely and certainly familiar with, the greatest philosopher, Iranian philosopher, Muslim philosopher after Avi Senna, whose books now are textbooks in the seminaries in Qom, in Mashhad, and uh, everywhere. And some of his ideas, of course, are being translated into other uh, languages and explained by, uh, you know, philosophers and scholars. Now, the son-in-law of uh, Sadruddin Shirazi is uh, Faiz. Hereafter, I call him Faiz. Now, he actually um, decided to re-edit uh, one of the most important books written by Al-Ghazali 600 years before his birth. The most important and the most well-known book of Al-Ghazali is Ihya al-Ulum, means revivification of Islamic sciences. Al-Ghazali himself was a jurist, was a, a mystic, and was a theologian. And uh, he came to the conclusion that uh, most unfortunately, uh, in his time and in, uh, in the time that he was living, all of religious sciences, according to him, were dead. And this is exactly what he says, what he mentions all were dead, except uh, law, which was alive, very lofty, very prestigious, and uh, especially mysticism, which according to him is the heart of Islamic teaching, of Islamic education, was absolutely forgotten and forsaken. So he decided to revive the religious sciences, especially and including Islamic mysticism, or rather Sufism. So that is the idea, and that is the goal of the book called Ihya'ul Ulu. That comes also in eight volumes, eight hefty volumes. And the book was uh, received by Muslim community during ages, very well received indeed many commentaries written on the book, and it's still one of the best books. To the extent that uh, some people had said that if the Prophet of Islam was not the last Prophet, then Al-Ghazali would have been the next Prophet after him. So this is the prominence and the high place that he occupies in, in the Muslim world, especially among the Sunni branch of Islam. Now, the book, Revivification of uh, Religious Sciences, or Yaul Ulum, was edited, rewritten, if you like, by Faiz. And uh, that's why I'm saying that the book has got two authors, one a prominent Sunni and the other one a prominent Shi'i scholar. Faiz also was a philosopher, a mystic, a jurist, and of course a poet. And uh, the poetry is something that Al-Ghazali lacked. He was not a poet, although he was a very, very brilliant writer in, in Persian. One of his, uh, although most of his writings are uh, in Arabic, but one of his uh, best books is Kimya Saadat, The Alchemy as, of Happiness, which is in Persian, and the style is, uh, is uh, superb, really. So, the book is called al Mahajatul Bayza, The Bright Way. This is the book, edit, as I said, edited by Faith, and you might say the book authored by two prominent authors, Al-Ghazali and Faith. And uh, that is the book that uh, actually constituted my first encounter with my first exposure to Shiism and Sunnism in a very serious scholarly way. As you might guess, and if you have got the fortune and the opportunity by the help of God, and for those of you who would like to be a serious student of Islam, I strongly recommend to read this book, you know, from cover to cover. That gives you a first-hand information 
about Islam, about Shiism, about Sunnism, not only in uh, general matters, but also in law, in theology, and especially, and more importantly, in ethics. So these are the main uh, you know, topics which you find in, in the book. And uh, then after reading this book, I actually started reading the, the original one, the Ya'ul Ulum. And after reading that and making annotations and comments and so on, then I wrote a very lengthy article making a comparison between the two. What has been left out by Faiz in his re-editing the book and what has been taken in by him? Now, I just give you here, because I am not going to, uh, to um, uh, review the book here, just this is by way of introduction. And uh, as I said, I recommend you, if you are an earnest you know, student of Islam, to read the whole book. One of the quantitative you know, um, uh, results that I came by was this, that Fez, mind you, Fez belongs to the Safavid period. And the Safavid period in the Iran history is known as the most radical period in Shiism. The, um, I was looking for a word for Ghali, and my uh, friends advised me to use the word hyperbolic or hyperbolist. I, I, I think that the, the meaning is, is clear. So hyperbolic approach to Shiism in the sense that the people who exaggerated, you know, some of the uh, teachings of, uh, of Shiism, especially the high position of imams and uh, things like that. So that was the period in which such a brand of Shiism was born. And faith is the child of his time. So one, what would ex expect from faith is to repudiate and reject you know, altogether what Al-Ghazali had said, especially that Ghazali was known that he was anti-Shiism, anti-Rafizi. This is in itself is a very strange, a very surprising, you know, endeavor taken by a Shia scholar to, uh, you know, uh, undertake editing of a Sunni book, which, as I said, is absolutely unique in the whole history of Islam, Shia and Sunni. But when you go deep into the content of the book, you would find, and this is more surprising, that about three-fourths 70 to 75 percent of the book is remained intact. It means that what has been changed at the hand of phase is only one fourth of the book. You might, you know, this is quantitative history if you like, you might say that if there is any serious real difference between Shiism and Sunnism is only in one fourth of ideas and uh, beliefs. The rest, three-fourths, is, is really common. And this is uh, witnessed not by me, not by you know, modern intellectuals, but by two you know, prominent traditional alims. And you know what is that three-fourths of the book which has remained intact and had been not changed by by faith, and that is the moral issues. So this tells you a lot about the nature and the essence of religion and religiosity. The main difference between the two books and the two authors are either in law or in theology. There, actually, you will find that they clash. They come to clash and to have some serious confrontations. But when it comes to uh, ethical, to moral issues, a peace, you know, is there. And you will find that both authors actually see eye to eye. And they have absolutely the same ideas. And sometimes even face praises, you know, Al-Ghazali for what he says. And even he does not try to change any of the sentences, any of the, because the style is, is bright. Uh, so, uh, this is the, uh, the main uh, I mean, introduction I wanted to um, uh, start my talk with. So I just gave you an idea of what Shiism and Sunnism have in common. 
and perhaps what is the main difference, the points of accord and discord. In three-fourths of uh, things, you will see that uh, they have got commonalities, and in one-fourth, which is the, as I said, in theology and in, in law, they have got, of course, differences. Now, I should not uh, exaggerate that one-fourth as well. I said that they have got differences in one for the ideas, but there also there are many things which are in common. You know, of course, I mean, we cannot find anything pure in this world. There is no pure Shiism, there is no pure Sunnism, there is no pure Christianity, nothing. There is no pure masculine, there is no pure feminine. We were talking about it when we were coming to this uh, meeting. No purity in this world. This is a material world. This is the world of contaminations, if you call it, impurities. Shiism is no exception. Sunnism is no exception. Islam is no exception. You know, everywhere you will have, you know, ideas coming from within, and they purely belong to Islam or Shiism, and there are many other ideas coming from elsewhere, and seldom and hardly you can make a distinction between these two. They are traditionally and historically so intertwined and so intermingled that the distinction is virtually impossible, especially for the people who live now, 1400 years after the advent of the prophethood and the rise of the prophet of Islam. Now, traditionally, when uh, this, this uh, introduction, by the way, tells you that what we make now of Shiism and Sunnism is relatively new. I'm not saying that um, these two are new or recent reconstructions, but you should be aware that roughly one century after the demise of the Prophet, there was no actually talk. Nobody actually uh, mentioned Shiism or Sunnism. That was not the order of the day, and these two words were not coined yet. So this is the, the orthodoxy, both in Shiism and in Sunnism, came much later. And hardly you can say, for example, that the followers of Imam Hassan or Imam Hussein were either Sunnis or Shi'is. No mention of that, and uh, it is absolutely irrelevant and anachronistic to use the words and terms of Shiism and Sunnism, at least for the first century of uh, Islamic history. I quite remember once, it's, it's a funny story. I was in the Netherlands where they you know, uh, branded me as the Erasmus of Islam. You know, I was there in order to receive my award. And before the award session, there was a conference, a panel, and I, plus Mr. Nasr Abu Zaid, who, who actually died a few months ago, most unfortunately, and another speaker, we were on the panel. And the speaker, who was an old former Marxist, actually, he um, suggested something for the reconciliation of Shi'is and Sunnis. People who look at the tradition from without, you know, sometimes they come up with very funny ideas. And so that was one instance. So he actually suggested that uh, it is good for Sunnis to apologize from Shi'is uh, because of the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. And then there will be a conciliation between Shi'is and Sunnis. And Abu Zaid, who is, was a Sunni, he was just sitting here besides me, and he whispered into my ears, I did not kill Hussein, and why should I apologize? And this was exactly how he put it. I did not kill Hussein, and, uh, and he was right. I mean, there was no Shi neither Shiism nor Sunnism at that time, and it is a, an utter joke you know, to use the word Sunnis and Shi'is for the people who killed Hussein or the people who followed him and loved him and so on and so forth. Especially, you should know that Mu'tazilites, uh, about whom I would like, uh, I will, you know, make some remarks later on, Mu'tazilites were, you know, the brand of Muslims who were neither Shi'is nor Sunnis, and always this is what happens, you know, before the uh, you know, rigid orthodoxy. You have got a fluidity in law, in theology, in everything, before the orthodoxy arrives. And that was the case in, in Islamic history. 
you did have neither Sunnis, I mean pure Sunnis, nor pure Shi'is. Rather, you had some Mu'tazilites who were both Shi'is and Sunnis. They accepted some ideas which are nowadays called Shi'ite ideas, and they then accepted some other ideas which are nowadays called Sunni ideas. So, traditionally, when uh, Shi'is uh, want to, dis to, to define Shi'ism, they put their finger of emphasis on the idea of the successorship of the Prophet. They say that uh, what made a divide between Shi'is and Sunnis was first and foremost the difference and this disagreement over the successorship of the Prophet Muhammad. Whereas Shiites think that uh, the, uh, the successor was appointed by the Muhammad himself in his lifetime, namely Ali, Sunnis, of course, they do not think so, and they think it was left to the Ummah, to the people, to elect, you know, a, a Khalif. And that was how they did it. At least historically, they did, they behaved like that, and they tried to elect the, the Khalifa, Abu Bakr, and then Omar, and so on and so on, you don't know the history. But according to Shi'is, none of these Khalifs were the right uh, rightly guided caliphs, and they were not, the validity was not there with their khilafah. Rather, Ali was appointed, and he was the right khalif and his descendants. So traditionally, this is the story which is usually told about the divide between Shi'is and Sunnis. And as you know, of course, Shi'is, uh, they always claimed, uh, you know, power. They were a minority, a very active minority, always claiming power and producing theories about the legitimacy of power. According to them, all non-Shiite power in, in the history of Islam were absolutely illegitimate. It was usurpation, and uh, it was uh, for the imams of Shiism to become the leaders and the imams of the ummah. Shia was a minority, and they used this minority identity in order to claim, you know, the right place in the history of Islam. It is very important that Shi'i, whether it is, uh, I mean, their beliefs are true or not, what actually it stems from the a minority identity is something that distinguishes them from other. Uh, sects, and especially the majority branch of Islam, which is uh, Sunnism. Um, it was not only the successorship of, uh, of the Prophet, but of course the descendants of the Prophet, who were also considered to be successors of uh, the right successors of the Prophet. Um, some of the, or perhaps most of the characteristics and the uh, attributes of prophets and prophethood were transmitted to imams, such as the infallibility of the prophet. The imams by Shi'is were considered to be infallible and occupying virtually the same place as the prophet occupied, sitting virtually on the same chair that the prophet sit. Now, uh, these are, of course, very well known, and everybody knows about Shiism. What I would like uh, to, uh, to uh, mention and to suggest as the main difference between Shiism and Sunnism is not very far from this, but I think one point here is usually neglected, but it is like blood running through the whole uh, you know, body of, of Shiism, and that is uh, the one which I'm going to mention. But let me, before mentioning that important point, just draw your attention to the history of Shiism. Because they were a minority, and an active minority, a protesting minority, now, um, of course, they used their history very well in order to, as I said, to assert their identity and their place in the whole you know, body of Islamic history. Look, three caliphs of the four rightly guided caliphs, Khulafa al Rashid, three of them were murdered, were assassinated. Omar was assassinated by an Iranian, 
Osman was, of course, killed and murdered in an uprising among the people of his time because of his misbehavior or whatever. And Ali also was assassinated by a Khariji, uh, Ibn Mulja. So this is a very well-recorded history, no doubt about it. But look at the reaction and at the behavior of the Sunni sect of Islam, Sunni branch of Islam, and the Shi'i branch of Islam. In the Shi'i branch of Islam, Ali is a martyr. Every year, actually, there is a great, a big mourning, you know, processions and ceremonies about the murder and assassination of Ali. You know, people take part in so many, you know, meetings and so on, beat their breast and this and that. There are a whole, you know, tradition of poetry about the martyrdom of Ali. But uh, the Sunni part of Islam, they have no such processions, they have no such ceremonies about the killing of Omar or either the Uthman. Now, much more important than that, of course, is the martyrdom of Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet, you know, which is the emblem of the Shi'i history, you know, and that was one of the main, main symbols of Shi'ism, the whole history of Shi'ism. Of course, it was uh, a very tragic event, no doubt about it. But then the use of this tragic event in order to assert the identity of Shiism was one of the cleverest, you know, cleverest, uh, <coughs> um, what is it, uh, <coughs> hmm? policies, yes, of, uh, of, uh, of Shiites. Of course, it was uh, recommended by the, uh, by the imams of Shi'is, and then followed by other Shi'is, and then in the Safavid period, of course, it was in full, full flower, up until now. But as I have indicated in, in, uh, I mean elsewhere, now, of course, the meaning of the symbols and everything under the uh, Shi'i rule in Iran has changed and had to be changed because Shi'ism was always anti-power, but now it is in power, and therefore using the Hussein history and story has got absolutely a different, you know, uh, meaning. And they have to change the whole thing, and they are changing actually, because at that time Hussein was, you know, in the other side and the ruler, the the ruler who had usurped the, the rulership and the power was uh, in power. But now, of course, the situation has drastically changed, uh, almost to the opposite. And so I'm not sure uh, what uh, they are going to make out from the history and story of Imam Hussein. Anyway, but let us look at the history of Shiism and the use that they made from the martyrdom of Ali, from the martyrdom of, uh, of Hussein. And even contrary to the truly recorded history, some of the Shi'is uh, <clears throat> claim that all Imams were martyred. But even the great historians of Shi'is, even the great theologians such as Sheikh Mufid, they very clearly say that not all Imams were martyred. Not all of them were assassinated. Some of them dead natural death. But it was good for the Shia identity you know, to claim and try to prove to the masses that all imams were oppressed, were under pressure, and uh, so they were either assassinated or poisoned, and so on and so forth. So this is, again, part of the mass history of Shiism, and this stems from the psychology of minority identity. When you live as a minority, you need to assert yourself, and you need a, a particular psychology, and you use parts, different parts of your history, and you make and reconstruct your heroes in order to answer your needs. And this is what we call it Shiism nowadays. Sunnism was a majority. They have got their own problems, and I'm not going to uh, speak to you about the reform in Sunnism, but uh, at least they did not have this minority issue, this minority identity, and the problems associated with it. That is absent from there. <clears throat> now, because of the minority identity, you know, Shiism, uh, most unfortunately, they had to actually cling to some misbehaviors, which nowadays I would say that we should be ashamed of. 
the, one of them is cursing the companions of the Prophet. That was a very, very bad thing, a very tragic decision made by whoever, I'm not sure. But anyway, that inflated the difference and the disagreements and the hostility and enmity between Shi'is and Sunnis. We have got still, the, 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 still the problem is with us. Sometimes I hear that, for example, in Pakistan, there are uh, Shi'is who sit in mosques or perhaps on the roof of the mosque and they, you know, very loud curse the companions of the Prophet and, uh, you know, this inflames, you know, the, the fire between the Shi'is and Sunnis and uh, so on and so forth. So this business of cursing was very unwelcome, very unpleasant decision made by some Shi'i leaders and still it is practiced in Iran, among Shi'is in Pakistan and elsewhere, and they curse the, the people who are beloveds of the Sunni majority, like the first caliph, the second caliph, and so on and so forth. And because of this, even some of them had to distort the history in order to fit it into some of these theological misguided ideas. So now the story is very lengthy, of course, I'm not going into that. So this is part of the Shi history, especially after the Safavid period. Another thing which, uh, again, is an ugly part of the Shi history is the claim of the corruption of the Quran. Now, this is completely denied by the ulama nowadays. They say, no, 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 they, they, they believe that the Quran has been unaltered, uncorrupted, and what is there is, has been there from the time of the Prophet. Nobody dared alter it, nobody has corrupted it. It was the promise of God in the Quran. God had promised that he would be the protector of the Quran and this and that. But when you go back to the history of Shi'ism, then you go back to the books of some of the prominent scholars of Shi'is, such as Al-Kafi by Al-Kulaini and some other uh, alims, they say quite explicitly, quite explicitly, that the Quran has been corrupted, has been altered. At least some of the verses, a, a great part of the Quran has been uh, omitted from the Quran. And that part which is omitted actually contained verses about the Imams and uh, you know, they, they write to be the successors of the Prophet and so on and so forth. Faiz, whom I mentioned here as uh, someone who edited the book of Al-Ghazali, he has got a book of Tafsir. He was a Mufassir himself. There are 12 important introductions to his Tafsir. He has written himself. One of the introductions I think that's the sixth introduction. He mentions this idea of the Quran being corrupted by others. He does not reject it. He does not say that it is not uh, okay. But what he says is this, okay, let us be content with the Quran nowadays because our Imams accepted it. You see, he doesn't say that historically the claim is, is not valid. He doesn't reject it, but he says, since Imams you know, agreed and accepted and used this copy of Quran, so let us accept it and let us uh, not indulge ourselves over the, uh, the Quran, whether it was corrupted or not. After Faiz, you know, in 13th century, roughly 150 years ago, there was a prominent Shi'i muhaddis, a man who was expert in traditions of Imams and uh, the Prophet, he wrote a book. You cannot find, you know, uh, the copies of the book nowadays. When I was in the Library of Congress last year, I tried to find a copy and no, no uh, chance uh, uh, and no success. Uh, seldom, you know, you can find a book. The book was about, I mean, uh, the, the, the topic of the book, actually, the title of the book is Fi Isbat Tahrif Kitab Rabb al It is. It is the book is there to prove that the book was corrupted, Quran was corrupted. And he mentions 120 proofs in order to prove this, uh, this idea. So the idea was still among the Shi'is, and this was one of the point that uh, usually Shi'ism has been attacked by other 
major branches of Islam. But nowadays, of course, as I said, I don't think that anybody would uh, have the same belief or would endorse you know, the idea that was for one time prevailing among some uh, Shi scholars. Anyway, this was also part of the history of uh, Shiism. <clears throat> now, for me, as I see the problem, the main point of divide, the main line of divide between Shi and Sunni is neither the, the historical event of successorship, it is anyway over, and we cannot discuss it anymore. It's not useful. And that is not really the case. The main line of divide is that according to the theory of Imamat in Shiism, the uh, prophet being the last prophet is uh, the idea of the prophet being the last prophet is somehow mellowed and somehow diluted. This is how I see it. If not, uh, disproved, you know. This is a very well known idea in the Quran and among all Muslims that the Prophet Muhammad was the last Prophet. He was the seal of Prophet according to the, uh, the Quran, Khatam al Nabiyin. Now, uh, this is of course a well known you know, part of Muslim theology, no doubt about it. It has got a normativity in it. It says to Muslims that whoever comes after me, do not pay any attention to him. If he claims that he is a prophet, do not pay any attention to him. Do not follow him. Do not listen to him. He, he must be a false prophet anyway. So this is a normative content of the, uh, the Khatamiyya, the prophet being the seal of all prophets. Now, what is prophethood? Now, let us go, you know, into the, uh, I mean, make a careful analysis of the, uh, of, of prophethood. Prophethood at least has got two, two uh, major pillars. The first pillar is revelation, receiving the revelation. So this is the first pillar. The second is infallibility. A prophet is an infallible person who receives revelation, okay, and then he, uh, actually transmit it to the masses. So this is, this is the nature and the essence of prophethood. All this has been claimed by Shi'is for their Imams, you know. They pay a lip service to Khatamiyya, but deep in heart, what they say about their Imams means that they actually ignore Khatamiyya, if not disproving it. It is just overlooking, just ignoring the Khatami, because all Imams receive revelations, and all of them, according to Shis, are infallible. Therefore, infallibility and revelation are all there. And that's why in Shiism, Imams are tantamount to prophet. I mean, they are virtually on the same level. What they say, what they do are considered and are taken by she is like what the prophet did or like what the prophet said, you know, on absolutely on the same level. There are so many, uh, you know, uh, pieces of law and legislation in Shiism that is neither in the Quran nor in sayings of the prophets. All come down to us from imams. But since imams are no less than prophets at all in any way. So we take what they say and what they did like what the prophet says, and it is as infallible, as valid, and as incumbent on us, like what the prophet had said and had enjoined us to do, or prohibited us <coughs> to, uh, to do. So I think this is Khatamiya is the main point of divide. Theologically speaking, I mean, if you go to history, the two histories are different. If you go to, I don't know, the uh, organizations of the cleric uh, and so on, there also you will find some other things. But no, I concentrate <coughs> mainly on the uh, theological point of view. And from the theological point of view, Khatamiya, I think, is the main point that uh, in Shiism has been diluted or perhaps ignored altogether. Let me even quote <coughs> a sentence from Sheikh al-Mufid, 
who is uh, perhaps the most important uh, theologian of Shiism. He says all Imams are prophets. But since we have been prohibited to call them prophets, we do not call them prophets. Otherwise, deep down and in heart, we consider them like prophets, any prophet, because they received revelation and they were infallible. Now, this is a major issue. I have written a number of articles about this, and of course, the articles were very controversial. I received some very harsh you know, uh, answers and rejoinders on the part of my adversaries. But I truly tell you, I mean, honestly, I didn't find any grain of truth of what they say. This is a very well entrenched, a very well established idea in the Shi'i circles. And if you talk about it, people, of course, will not uh, come to agree with it you know, soon. But I think going deep into the heart of Shi'ism, you will find that the theory of Imama is a theory which flies in the face of prophethood of the Khatamiya of prophethood, of prophet being actually 12 Imams or 12 uh, prophets who were no less than the prophet himself at all. And all what we say, I mean, she is say about them is like talking about a prophet. This does not mean that I would like to, uh, you know, to reduce, perhaps to diminish the, the, the uh, the place of Imam. They were very respectable. They were recommended by the Prophet to be respected, to be listened to, and to be followed. Actually, for Shiism, in order to be a good Shiism, is to follow Imams and to find Prophets through Imams because they were the best vehicles and the best channels in order to find the Prophet and to see what he had originally said because they were true transmitters of his message. <laughs> to the uh, Ummah. But the theory that developed during the Shi'i period and the Shi'i history, and that was not only because of uh, Shi'i creed and theology, but also because of the minority issue that I mentioned, you know, Imams, you know, were elevated to the position of the Prophet himself, and they were given the same respect, the same position, and uh, the same prestige and privilege that the Prophet himself enjoyed. This is the main thing. Now, this has got, of course, it is not a theological issue as such. It has got consequences and implications, which I'm going to uh, mention to you later on. But So please keep this in mind. <clears throat> One of the implications of this is a kind of uh, maximalistic religious approach. You know, according to uh, Shiism, virtually you have got everything in religion. Because if Prophet had not mentioned everything, then Imams actually tried to mention and to uh, make the religion complete. So virtually there is no place for, uh, you know, for more deliberation, for more contemplation. So you will find everything in Hadith, and you can extract it, and you can uh, uh, apply it to, to practice. So this is prevailing and prevalent among, uh, this is the dominant idea among Shiites, especially among the ulama of Shia, that they n need nothing outside the religion, outside the Shiism. They have got imams and they have got, you know, their uh, hadith, and so they can uh, use them. You will see that among the Shi'i theologians, there is extensive debates about, for example, determinism, indeterminism, and about such things, about uh, who is a true Muslim, who is not a true Muslim. The, uh, the main body of Islamic theology was developed by the Sunni branch of Islam rather than the Shi'i. Why? Because Shi'is were content that whatever the Imam says, that would be the theology, no matter what he says no debate about what he says. If he says that determinism is okay, then determinism is okay. If he says that indeterminism is okay, then indeterminism is okay. And that's, that's enough. So no way and no place to go further. But 
you know, the main body of theology was something which, as I said, constructed and developed by Sunni theologians, Mu'tazilites and Ash'arites and so on. They have extensive, you know, uh, writings about this. Some of them recovered now and some not recovered. But uh, you will see that the debate among them was really a very hot debate, very constructive. Shiites actually took from Mu'tazilites. You know, the theology of Shiism is taken from Mu'tazilism. They claim that they have taken it from their imams. But when do you, when you go deep into the uh, uh, books of Shiites, most of the Shi'i theology is Mu'tazilites. This is what actually I, again, uh, mentioned. Shi'i mysticism also is still the main mystical books which we use, especially Rumi, for example, Muhyiddin Arab, all comes from, not from the Shi'i scholars, not from the Shi'i Imams. That comes from the Sunni scholars. This is not because Shi'ism is a bad, you know, ideology. It is because they have a content, you know, they were maximalist in religion. They thought that they had everything they needed through their imams. They were content with some hadith in the books of hadith. And they were not, you know, really ready to develop and to improve on it and to discuss it and to criticize it. This is very important. Since imams were infallible, you did not have, you know, the, the right to criticize them. You know, you had to accept what they said. And that actually, to some extent, closed the door of criticism to, uh, to the Shi'i sect. And the minority identity also furthered it. Because when you are a minority, you do not allow anybody to dispute things, lest you should make you know, the, the, the divide you know, more and more, deeper and deeper. So first of all, you become conservative because you are minority. Secondly, because you have got infallible imams, so you will stop criticizing them because they are infallible. And that's why during, I would say, 10 centuries of the Shi'i uh, life, neither their theology developed nor uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the hadith and the law. It was virtually in a very uh, stagnant uh, situation. No, of course, I mean, the situation is very different. But uh, during the 10 centuries of the Shi'i life, especially theology, there are only two books in theology written in the whole life of Shi'ism. One by uh, Nasiruddin Tusi and the other one, which is incomplete in the time of the Safavid period. But there are so many books in theology. Theology was not, you know, a subject loved by Shi'is. Criticism was not a subject loved by Shi'is. And that was, as I said, because they were a minority among a majority, and they had to be conservative enough to protect themselves from all attacks, from within and from without. <coughs> Shariati, I must mention, Shariati, who was aware of such shortcomings in the Shi'i thought, but then, of course, he lived in a pre-revolutionary era in Iran under the rule of Shah, and uh, was clever enough to turn Shi'i ideology to turn Shiism into an ideology, an unread ideology at that. So he took some very selective points, selected points from the history of Shiism, especially the idea of Imama, the idea of the martyrdom of Hussein, and some other things. He turned some exceptions into rules in order to you know, create, to produce, to reconstruct a red ideology out of Shiism. Uh, and he was very successful. And that was how it played into the hand of the revolutionaries and the clerics, you know, and you know, how he uh, was the teacher and the leader of the uh, revolutionary ideology. <clears throat> 
For him, not only the idea of, he secularized in a sense, all this, even the idea of imama in Shiism, the idea of martyrdom, the idea of Mahdaviya, I mean the, the, the hidden imam and all these things. He secularized them in order to make an ideology from them. And he was, as I said, very, very successful. In the whole history of Shiism, only Hussein was the one who you might call a revolutionary person, although the word revolution does not work here and is a very misnomer. But you might call him, a, but the rest of the imams, they were not revolutionary in that sense. They did not make an uprising against the rulers of the time. Some of them even you know, had you know, peace with them. So Hussein was an exception, but in the hands of Shariati, he became a rule in Shiism. And he invited all Shi'is to to revolt against the, against the oppressive uh, you know, ruler and so on. So through him, the reform, now I'm coming to the idea of reform. For him, the reform of Shiism was to turn it into a red ideology. And in order to do that, he, as I said, you know, made a very you know, careful selection from Shi'i history. And especially, you know, figures like Abu Zar, like Hussein, like Zainab, and some other people like this. He never actually take into consideration, he never mentioned Hassan, the brother of Hussein, he never mentioned Reza, you know, one of the descendants of Hussein, and this and that, because he did not like them, and he did not use of them. So they did not fit into the reconstructed ideology of Shariati about Shiism. So a reform should be a complete reform. A reform should address you know, the, the pivotal point, the pillars of Shiism. A reform cannot be a reform just in order to make Shiism into an ideology, into a weaponry to be used against the oppressive rulers. That was how Shariati did. And that was how the clerics in Iran actually tried to do, and that actually worked very well for them. You know, worked very, very well for them. I personally met some Sunni scholars who really was thinking that uh, <coughs> Shiism was the best weapon in order to uh, make a revolution. You know, contrary to Sunnism, which according to them was somehow peaceful. And all this came through, uh, of course, Shariati. What, uh, you know, uh, comes to my mind, <coughs> uh, in matters of reform about Shiism, is, uh, of course, we have to correct some of our behaviors, such as stopping, stop cursing the companions of the Prophet, you know, uh, make some corrections about the idea of shafa and intercessions, um, the idea of corruption of the Quran, which is fortunately now over, and I hope it will not come back again, <clears throat> to reread the history of Shiism, not to make exceptions a rule, not to make rules exceptions. So this is very important, and most of all, and most importantly, the idea of the imam. The theory of imama is, is a very faulty theory. That should be revisited, should be uh, revisited, you know, th thoroughly. Because at the first, you know, Shiites constructed and suggested the idea of imama because they thought that the whole ummah needs a leader. And that leader should be the infallible imam. But when it came to the 12th imam, he is now hidden. So they had to change the theory of imama. The ummah does not have any imam anymore nowadays, though they thought that perhaps the imam can lead the ummah from behind the veil. And even if he is not you know, among the people, it doesn't matter. So they changed the idea of the imama in order to fit the history of, uh, of uh, Shiism. <coughs> And the theory of imama also, because it claims the infallibility for the imams, also uh, had its own harmful dimensions 
for the uh, Shi'i creed. First of all, it made you know unnecessary enmity among Shi'is and Sunnis, and secondly, it stopped and prevented us from criticizing the Imams and uh, from finding our ways and uh, not to uh, you know following them blindly, but rather with close, with uh, open eyes. So a change in the theory of Imamat, I think, will do the job and will make us much closer to our Sunni majority. And uh, the, 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 the Sunni majority, of course, if they come to realize that the Imams in the Shiism, they had been you know, recommended by the Prophet, and they are respectable people and figures, and through them they can find the tradition of the Prophet in a much better and safer way. So I think through this reform, we might be able to come closer to each other and perhaps to overcome the divide. But, uh, I mean, this will be my last remark here. Um, my, I mean, from the sociological point of view, I think both Shiism and Sunnism are two different explanations of Islam. Of course, actually, um, there is no point in trying to bridge them or perhaps to reject one of them in favor of the other. But if we look more honestly at the history of Shiism and Sunnism, I think there are so much common points among us which makes us closer to each other. So this is my last point, and I expect your observations and uh, questions, if you like. Thank you very much. <coughs>